Hi, my dear friends. Welcome to uh, my motor control program. Um, we are seeing one by one theories. In that, we have already seen the reflex theory, the hierarchical theory, the motor control theory, and now we, it is a turn for the systems theory. The systems theory is a very important theory which uh, redefined the um, uh, control of uh, movement in human body. It also gave a different view uh, from the systems point of view. You have a lot of systems in your body. This is the most accepted model of uh, um, movement control theories as of now available based upon which more um, effective treatments are being placed upon. So when I say systems theory, when you're reading systems theory, you have a lot of terminological barriers, which I encompassed when I was doing my post graduation. There are some terminologies which used to come and I'll, I'll be blocked there if I don't know the answer for the uh, meaning for the terminology as such in uh, physiological meaning. So I'll be taken back and I will be very resistant to read this uh, further. So I'm going to help you in doing that. Always how I do this is by means of taking up more examples. So I'm going to produce more examples for you to make you understand what is systems theory is actually. So uh, when, I, when it comes to systems theory, they uh, said it is uh, not about only the nervous system that is concerned about the movement production. Because um, uh, this guy, uh, Bernstein, he uh, raised a lot of questions which were unanswered by the previous theories. This uh, few questions are given here. He asked a question like how human movements are modified over a period of time. For very example, when you start typing, uh, when you have a typewriter, initially you make some attempts and you are very slow. And later on, once you keep practicing this, how your speed is increased and the way with which you are doing also differs. So this was not explained before. How environment influences movement? We, we asked this as a major question in the motor control theory and we gave this classical example of uh, people walking over a plane surface and when people are walking on a surface which they perceive that is slightly dangerous to them and their walking pattern changes. Okay. And uh, how initial position influences the human movement? So a simple example is sit to stand uh, based upon the initial position where you are seated, the height of the table, the thigh support, your body positioning, angulation, whether you have a uh, hand rest or not, all these things also influence the movement of uh, the human body because in from different heights, you're going to find it different uh, difficulty levels differing. For example, if it is going to be a very short stool, you're going to find it very difficult to get up. Whereas if it is a uh, a very tall stool, you're going to uh, find it uh, difficult in jumping. If it is an ideal height, you're going to find it very easy to get up. So, so these things are also modifying the human movement. So how this variety of movements are added to human uh, movements. So who is giving the variety? Why this variety comes up? All these questions was there from Brenston and he was repeatedly asking this question. So there are, uh, he explained them as there are uh, um, the internal and external forces that are very important in determining the human movement. There are a lot of forces externally like your gravity. Uh, uh, there are also a lot of uh, uh, forces internally like inertia, your muscle activity, which determines movement. So how it determines movement? Uh, when the gravity is there, we walk differently. When the gravity is not there, we float and we walk. We, our human movement is different. Do I mean to say that? No, I didn't mean to say that. Of course, that is also true. But what I mean to say was, when my biceps was contracting against gravity, it differs, it, it behaves in a different way. And when it is contracting towards gravity, it, dif uh, it contracts with different force production. If it is going to lift a weight, the, the, for the contraction uh, of the muscle fibers differ when if it is not carrying weight, the, uh, the uh, things differ, the muscle contraction differs. Um, the inertia is also a very important uh, component here and also the internal forces, what are the muscles that are contracting and how many muscles are contracting. And all these factors determine the human movement rather than saying that it is only the nervous system that is responsible for movement. Okay, so these forces are very vital. So 
what is the basic concept? What uh, uh, this um, uh, theory states? Because this is not a single person's perspective. It is a combination of various uh, researches which are done in the late uh, 20th century and the uh, beginning, even beginning of the 21st century. So they say that there is a hierarchy that do exist. There is a hierarchy of upper centers, lower centers, but not like how the hierarchical theory explained. It was not a top-down flow that determines the movement always. Remember this word, always. Okay. In, in a hierarchical theory, if you remember, I told you that they said, uh, the higher centers are the one which uh, are planning the movement and uh, determining the movement strategy and that is being sent to the uh, middle centers, which instructs uh, the lower centers to execute the movement by means of the muscles and the peripheral uh, nerves and the joints. But here what it says, there is a, a reverse inflow, that is the uh, down to top flow. Okay, so um, how this can be viewed as? The bottom up factor, like the structure of the body, the environment and the nature of the task and at hand is very important. So what they say is, uh, it is not always the nervous system or the higher centers that is uh, essential. The movement is an interaction between the individual, that is the person who is moving, the environment in which he is moving, and also for what he is moving, that is a task. What is the task on his hand and why he is moving? And in what environment he is moving. Imagine when you're going to a meeting and you're sitting with high five high dignitaries, the way you take the tumbler of water and sip the water is different. Whereas when you're at home, how you take the water, it is different. How this behavior of mo movement has a behavior, right? Behavior and movement are uh, interlinked. So how this behavioral modification of movement takes place. So uh, that is because we are not moving in an isolated plane. We are moving in contrast, uh, sorry, uh, in, in the context of the task and the environment. So this is what this theory said. Okay, this example, I think, would give you a different uh, view when you're seeing movement. So this theory proved this wrong and this is right. So now how movement takes place? Yes, there is a higher center. What is the role of the higher center? It selects response. It selects a response. For example, if you are in a situation, right? You want to um, save a small kid who is in water. Okay, example, she's in a water, she's in water. You want to save the kid. So your uh, higher centers will uh, detect uh, the situation and it will give a response that you, are, you have to save the child. It is going to tell that you're going to save the child. The lower centers, sends this information to the uh, uh, next uh, level called as the synergies. The synergies do exist. The synergies are the one which are combining the muscle to produce force. That is, the synergies are the one which determines which muscle has to work, how much of force has to be generated, and when it has to be generated. Okay, the instruction is to rescue the child the muscle are going to do the work in, in the process. If it finds it difficult, uh, 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 it will uh, change its force of contraction. When it, is, it has to pull the child from the water, it has to use the force that is uh, going to be used. So that the synergy is very important. What is the role of the synergy? The synergy has to work in making the uh, work less uh, tedious, can do the uh, it, it will make the movement do for a longer period of time and without much energy expenditure so that's why when you have when you see uh, patients with stroke you don't you should not say that as a synergistic movement you should say it's an abnormal synergy there also muscles work together but not in the correct synergy so that is the problem there the muscles are not combinedly working in a proper synergy because muscles are not always used to work alone. So that we should understand. The concept of uh, Bobat, Brunstrom, all these things, they said that as if the muscles were working isolatedly before and after stroke, they have started working as a synergy. That is entirely wrong. The muscles are trained to work in synergy because they don't move isolatedly. They move it as a bunch. For them, the target is the task. What task they are doing, based upon that, muscles will contract. 
So I hope you can understand this. Uh, the higher centers, yes, they do have a good role, but not a big role. They are going to select the response because visual system gives input to the brain that a, a child is struck in water and the child, the brain has to save whether to rescue or not. Because if the flow of water is too much, if you are going to risk your body, if your your own life, and uh, in that case, you will you will call for help, but you will not jump into the water and uh, save the child. So the brain has to consider all these things, the flow of the water, the atmospheric temperature, it's not so chill, whether uh, your efforts will guarantee that the child will be saved or uh, the, your efforts will uh, result in your, uh, the loss of your life also. So all those critical uh, decisions the brain will take. And if in case the brain says, okay, we are going to save the child, then the lower center sends the information to the synergistic uh, muscle system in the body and the synergy uh, is the one which is going to determine all these things so this is how they explain the movement and actually the movement happens this way so uh, as i told you before uh, individual muscles are working towards one target every muscle are working towards one target that is accomplishment of the task so classical example for that can be given as a honey bee a hive where all the honeybees are active they are moving but moving towards one direction water molecules there are a lot of water molecules when the water is flowing all of them flows in one direction and with one motivation so uh, this is what somewhere cook said uh, uh, as an example in her book that uh, how movement takes place in the body there are a lot of muscles moving but all the muscles are moving with one motive, motive, that is the task. It has to accomplish the task. If all the muscles are able to be moved isolatedly, but still if the patient is non-functional, if the task is not accomplished, then the rehabilitation is of no use. So that is what we are emphasizing time and again, not to concentrate on individual muscle and concentrate on a group of muscle work. So this synergy word has been misinterpreted over a period of time. When we say, uh, do synergy exist in the patient? They say, uh, the, the therapist says, yeah, the synergy is very strong. Of course, the synergy should be there because the muscles are trained in a pattern to work together. They are not trained to work isolatedly. But when it comes to performing uh, this sort of a movement in stroke, then that is the abnormal synergy which can be easily eliminated if these muscles are combined to be or combined to work in an abnormal pattern they can be guided to work in a normal pattern okay so one more example uh, um, um, karen shepherd has uh, sorry uh, shambhay cook has mentioned in her book is um, if you read a sentence okay a complete sentence it gives meaning likewise if you uh, see uh, you have in a sentence you have different words and you have every words have some sentence so imagine these uh, sentences uh, uh, these words out of uh, every sentence and letters out of every word so these uh, letters are the muscles okay the word is the synergy and the sentence is the task so when you read it together and if the sentence makes meaning then only there is a value for these letters and words which are combined together. Otherwise, there is no meaning. So make sure that this sentence makes some meaning. That is the combination of muscle activity makes some meaning by means of accomplishing the task. So if you see synergy where the synergy is used, if you want to plug, uh, take a, a object from the loft, you are going to use a synergy. The synergy is going to be uh, different from individual uh, how they have been trained so far individual carry a bag of weight in a different way somebody uh, carry it like this somebody carries it on their back somebody carries it on their uh, uh, lower limb uh, sorry uh, carry it on the, uh, hanging down so the synergy difference differs from individual uh, it, it is in whichever way they are comfortable they used to do that um, and uh, for every activity, there is a synergy. You can see this uh, diagram, these three pictures. People reach out to objects uh, with some synergy here. The, the thing is, it's not the one muscle that is contracting. It is all the muscles are contracting towards accomplishment of the activity. They have to pick up the ball. There, the guy has to pick up something from the loft. And this guy, from a seated position, has to take a ball. 
So which hand he is going to prefer based upon the environment. If the ball is going to be on the left side, he prefers the left hand. If it is going to be on the right side, he is going to prefer the right hand. So the environment, the synergy, uh, all these things plays a very important role. So what they say, they say that the human body is not perceived as a biological unit. You should see them as a mechanical unit, a machine. You can ask a robot to walk with uh, just uh, electrical circuit in that, but it will walk in only a given pattern in which it is being programmed. It cannot change its pattern. So then comes the option of variability. The robot do not have a variability, whereas the human has a lot of variability. How this variability was seen by other theories, they said that it was an error. The body is trying to do some erroneous movement, that is an error movement, um, which becomes rectified with practice. So for example, if a patient uh, for the first time is given a task to do, uh, to be accomplished, he takes a lot of efforts in uh, um, doing it correctly. The other theory said that the initial error will rectify and the patient will start uh, doing the movement properly after some time. But how dynamic systems theory said that this is a various movements and combinations, uh, combination and permutation the body is trying to uh, collect in grabbing the uh, uh, task or an object from a particular thing. So this is uh, not an error movement. Okay, so this variety of attempts when the patient is doing or the subject is doing will make the subject more stable. That's why if you see people who are highly active, who has gone out to various areas like trekking and all these things are, they are very stable because they have given a variety of experience to their body. They have experienced variety of movements. So they become very stable. So uh, whereas a person who has not given a variety of movements to the body is not stable. Uh, for a very classical example, after deconditioning, when the patient is uh, bedridden for a period of time, when he's going to come on come onto the streets, he find this, finds it very difficult to walk because his body is not subjected to variety of movements. Um, this is what is going to happen after COVID scenario also. I expect all the uh, road traffic accidents and uh, the number of uh, slip and fall are going to increase because we all are... Uh, have not given much experience to our uh, human body and the brain in terms of movement and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the situational instincts have uh, been put paid for a quite long period. I would say this this four months or five months is a quite long period. Okay, so um, all the attempts, uh, abnormal attempts the body takes to accomplish a task was considered as an error by other uh, theories. But this theory said that the body is recording a lot of variabilities or in case uh, this variability is needed later on, the body can come out with various strategies. Not on, It is not dependent on only one strategy, but it can have very variety of strategy. So uh, to be in precise terms, optimal variability provides for flexibility, adaptive strategies, allowing adjustment to environmental change, and as such, in a central feature of normal movement. For example, if a patient is uh, uh, walking uh, on a street, suddenly if there is a movement of the surface, or suddenly somebody is coming in between, he should have a variability in walking pattern. He should have, um, or somebody's uh, gunman is coming and firing, he should know how to sit and walk. So all these variabilities are not error moments, but an adaptive movement strategies, which may be useful in some sort of uh, uh, the daily life situation or emergency situation. So this example is a very good example. This is called as a, a tractor uh, diagram. So there is a state called as an attractor state the degree to which the flexibility exists, flexibility in terms of movement exists, to change a preferred pattern of movement is characterized as a attractor well. So you give more experience to the body about movement. The, the, the body takes a lot of attempts in doing these uh, adaptable movements. Um, it becomes more stable. Can you see? As long as this first diagram is where the patient do not attempt many movement, uh, he is trained in a particular way to move. So he does not have variety of movement. So he's highly unstable. If the conditions are going to be that 
uh, the given situation uh, is changed, the environmental is changed, the person becomes very unstable. Whereas if the patient is trained in multiple uh, angles, if he is subjected to variety of movements uh, in his attempt to accomplish certain tasks, he becomes more stable. Even if there is any variability in the environment or the task difficulty differs, he's going to be very stable. So the attractor well, we call this as an attractor, uh, not we, uh, the people who determine this concept, uh, they uh, termed it as an attractor well. More deeper this attractor well is, more uh, stable the patient is going to be. So uh, classical example for a physiotherapist, uh, we say that uh, the patient, uh, when you're educating a movement, move, move it slowly, steadily, uh, reach the end range, come back, movement slowly, steadily. That doesn't, that doesn't uh, uh, gives the patient the actual uh, movement experience that he wants to do. Everybody has his own pace of moving for own task. Okay, if it is withdrawing from a heat, the speed differs. When you are uh, cuddling a child, the movement differs. When you are uh, touching an uh, animal, the movement speed uh, differs. So likewise, every movement has got, got its own velocity of movement, the force of contraction based upon the task and the environment as we keep on saying, okay? So if you're going to train your patient only to sit to stand from a standard chair, that is not going to be sufficient. You have to give a variety of movement for the patient. You have to make the patient sit to stand, not only uh, in a given atmosphere. The chair has to be kept in a, uh, a skiddy surface and ask him to sit to stand. Put the chair on a, a sofa, uh, sorry, a, a cushiony surface and ask him to sit to stand. So these are the various variety of uh, experience you are giving because the human body should have a variety of strategies to adapt to the demands. So what is the limitation of this such a such an elaborate uh, uh, theory? If, uh, the, if at all you want to find some uh, fault with this theory, uh, it, it's going to be uh, the uh, movement of the theory away from the control of the nervous system. This, this theory states that it is not the nervous system that is important for movement. It is the other factors, the forces, the environment, the task, the musculoskeletal system, the respiratory system, the, the uh, other systems, the, even the immune system, which is responsible for movement to happen. Because uh, if your musculoskeletal system is not good, you, are, you, you cannot move uh, your body, uh, though your central nervous system is intact. So this theory clearly stated that it is not about the nervous system. So if at all you say there is a limitation, you can say uh, the motor control has moved away from the nervous system and the understanding about the nervous system here is uh, significantly less compared to the physical factors and the external factors. But what are the clinical implications? The um, current uh, functional uh, approach or task specific training is based upon dynamic system theory the human body is considered as a mechanical unit. It is not considered as a, a thing which is controlled only by the central nervous system. We always perceive that central nervous system is the one which is commanding and if, in case the central nervous system is lost, the entire movement and combination permutations are lost. But when you consider a human body as a mechanical unit, of course, there is every possibility of you rectifying these movements are possible. And Many systems combines to form the movement. If you keep on concentrating only on the nervous system, then you're going to fail. So you have to attest to the musculoskeletal system very importantly, particularly the muscle, the force generation of the muscle and the synergy with which the combined muscle works, that synergy if it is efficient and also give variety to the movement. So environment plays a very vital role. If you are going to re-educate your patient in only a, a constrained environment, he's going to find it very difficult to go to a family environment or he's finding it uh, difficult in a community environment even more. And his productivity and his social participation is going to be questioned here, even though you term him as rehabilitated, but he's not completely uh, socially rehabilitated. So that is very important. And uh, giving a variety of uh, uh, movements is very important, as important as giving the reputations. More practice is needed, more variety is also needed. So I have mentioned the uh, reference here, 
to show that uh, it is more recent. Uh, okay. So, my dear friends, when you are reading this theory uh, in, through Shamve Cook or any other uh, uh, concept, uh, any other books uh, or blogs, you will find it very difficult to comprehend with certain uh, terminologies like self-organization, emergence theory, multi-casuality, redundancy or redundant uh, movements, motor discontrol, all these things will be confusing you. But uh, give more uh, examples to everything. Re try to read more examples when you're reading theories because uh, when I was doing my post-graduation, when I encounter such words, I will stop reading because uh, this is an obstacle actually for a reader. So uh, just skip this, try to Google it out. What is the example for that? Uh, Google gives a lot of examples for words where these sentence, are, the words are used in a sentence. So that will help you in understanding this. Uh, yeah, I'm expecting you to uh, give more queries and uh, we can have a healthy discussion on this, particularly in my WhatsApp uh, group, uh, in my academy uh, WhatsApp group, also in the uh, YouTube and in the Facebook. Thank you so much. Looking forward for the uh, next session.